And we're back on the program with part two of this hour as we explore what the heck is going on at the VA Phoenix that we have these secret lists and what to do about it and whose heads shall roll. My next guest is Lieutenant Colonel United States Air Force Wendy Rogers. You may know that name. She's running for Congress, District 9, against Kirsten Cinema. This is the district. This District 9 is where the Vet Administration Phoenix is actually located. Colonel Rogers, hello. Welcome to the program. It's an honor to be here, Terry. Thank you. It's an honor to have you. Of course, I called you because this is the district that you want to represent in Congress and because of your military background. Um, uh, so let's start at the beginning. You know, we have been looking over several weeks now of this dust stop, which is mounting evidence that there's this secret list. When a vet would come in, a vet would uh, sit with uh, some administrator and they would type in all of the information of what that vet needed. But then the vet would leave with his family and there's all the information of his medical needs and records and all that. But then rather than click send into a computer so that the computer has data on that man or woman, it was instead printed out. And so the secret is that it never hit the computer. It was instead printed out, taken upstairs to higher ups and ultimately shredded. Thus, for the reason we're finding out, alleged, alleged, the reason is so that administration could appear better uh, on the books with the brass in Washington or Congress in Washington or whoever is the boss in Washington all the way up and then maybe uh, get some extra money in his or her pocket uh, because the numbers look good for treating vets. Whereas the reality is vets were lined up, lined up, lined up, Wendy, and some, in fact, allegedly died. Forty is a pretty big amount, a uh, pr- pr- pretty, pretty uh, awful number to take a look at it, those who may have died as a result to not even being seen by a doctor. Your reaction? First of all, I was also not only a uh, United States Air Force pilot uh, during my 20-year career, but the first three years I was uh, a clinical social worker in the military uh, medical health system, not the VA, but the active duty uh, mental health clinic. Uh, so I have taken an especially um, close eye and interest at this problem. I am also a user of the uh, VA hospital, as is my retired uh, Air Force officer husband. And it is my uh, opinion that the VA here in Phoenix uh, has committed criminal malpractice. Uh, if this were a civilian hospital system, the director would have been fired, not put on administrative leave, and uh, then the investigation would have ensued. By the time this airs, as, as we all know here in the, in the studio, uh, these remarks will air a few days after you and I have talked. Uh, we may find that the problem uh, goes more deeply than uh, the director herself. It would not surprise me in the least. Uh, the, the tragedy. Uh, that this is, is just incalculable. Uh, you know, I spent eight out of 20 years of my career overseas, and when a uh, military member gets sick abroad, so to speak, either overseas or, or on the battlefield, we take care of him or her immediately, mm-hmm. and we render the best medical care possible. And for this to happen to those who have served and who are at home, and in many cases got one or two appointments and then uh, left to die. Uh, it's just, uh, it's very, it's beyond sad. Do you, it's, think uh, when, do you think, Wendy, that this has been a long-standing culture of uh, lining one's pockets at the expense of vets? And not uh, all the vets, you, you know, are, are have been on this list. There are some that, of course, are being treated and so forth. But to the point that we have allegedly 40 deaths, can you imagine all the ones that haven't died and they're still waiting and maybe on the verge of death or the cancers are growing or whatever their injury is, not being paid attention to? I read one report where, where it was something in the vicinity of you go in and, and you get an appointment, the appointment for a primary doctor is a year away. This this is outrageous. Do you think there has been this culture of this? Because a lot of people say, well, what else is new? We've been screaming about this for a long time. 
This has been uh, a perfect storm in the making. The Sun Belt states in the United States, Florida and Arizona in particular, have had to absorb an increasing number of veterans uh, to treat. Uh, 99 to 2002, the VA eligibility criteria increased. And then maybe in about, oh, 2005, we might have had as many as 7 million vets then uh, to service. And then, of course, the economy tanked uh, around the 2007-2008 time frame. And then with uh, people uh, not wanting to use Medicare but to use the VA instead, you had more veterans then approaching the VA system. And then with the advent of Obamacare, uh, you have even more veterans wanting to use the system. Uh, my husband could not even find a parking spot last week, uh, just five days ago, driving around uh, to go in to get a uh, VA appointment. I have another uh, young man who who I know closely, uh, a former Army uh, corporal, who had an appointment uh, to have his his lab work done and was called uh, the morning of saying, we can't even have you, this was a week ago, uh, we can't even have you come in here because we have no one uh, to service you today to treat you. This has been a uh, perfect storm in the making. And the other aspect is the way the VA funding works for uh, uh, an institution like the Phoenix VA Hospital is it's a two-year-out snapshot and then funding uh, results. So, for example, 2015 will receive money for how many patients were based on uh, being treated in 2013. So it's a two-year-out disconnect with reality. And so you have more people being treated, but the funding uh, is not now, why is that? Why, why, why is that? And should you win this congressional seat, what are you going to do about that? What I want to do tomorrow about it is for the Phoenix VA Hospital to immediately hire 20, 20, 20 more primary care providers. And this can be done now. And this can be done one of two ways. You can either take... Uh, uh, VA uh, p- providers from Rust Belt states who are keeping up with the flow and have them temporarily come here to Phoenix to address the backlog. And during that time, you can be hiring uh, local providers because admittedly uh, there is a federal background investigation check that needs to take place. And because of the wheels of bureaucracy uh, that turn so slowly, that typically takes four to six weeks. But that can be expedited into being just one week. So we can ameliorate the problem right now by hiring uh, 20 primary care providers. And and I hope everybody understands uh, a primary care provider these days is not necessarily a medical doctor or a doctor of osteopath. It can be a nurse practitioner. It can be a registered nurse. It can be a physician's assistant. That's right. So if we we provide uh, 20 more of these professionals uh, to cover the gap right now uh, and in so doing expedite the federal background investigative process, which is, I understand all that, fingerprint check, background check. We can expedite that. Private practice can do it in a week. And then in the meantime, or even on a more uh, than temporary basis, bring some doctors in from other VA hospitals that aren't impacted the way uh, Phoenix is. Do you think 20 is enough, at least for this temporary period? Yes, I, I, as a health care provider, have uh, talked to people on the inside. Uh, in my and that pr- is, Go ahead. And that is the consensus uh, that could uh, ameliorate the problem right now. And the other, the other uh, fix would be two more registered nurses for each clinic, because right now they don't have coverage for if somebody goes on leave, if somebody takes vacation. And that is to the detriment of uh, treating the patient. So if they added two more RNs uh, per clinic and added 20 more primary health care providers uh, that go across uh, uh, the spectrum, this could be handled. And the whole notion that we have to wait 
for the investigative process to continue. Oh, that's, my God. That's, that's a nightmare. That's a nightmare. That's, there's no reason uh, these two processes can't be concurrently uh, uh, working along in parallel. You can investigate while you take care of vets. Uh, Absolutely. My husband right. also tested the system last week to call in. He was put on hold and given the runaround uh, with three different receptionists uh, in 45 minutes and was never able to get through to get his need satisfied. So nothing has changed. All you've heard about is how terrible it is, which it is. It's a tragedy. It's, as I say, criminal malpractice. But no one is talking about on the practical side, what we can do to fix the problem. Well, I'm glad you are, uh, Wendy. Uh, Wendy Rogers here on the Terry Gilbert Show. Let's take a quick break. We'll talk more about solutions when we come back with her. And should she win this congressional seat, what she will do when she gets into Congress, how she'll hit the ground running on this problem. I'm sure it'll be at the forefront. It's the Terry Gilbert Show, News Talk 550 KFYI. I'll be right back. The Sean Hannity Show, weekday afternoons at 106. News Talk 550 KFYI, the Valley's talk station. We're back with our discussion as part of my uh, Go Deep and Broad on the vet story. And we're speaking with Lieutenant Colonel Wendy Rogers, who is running for Congress, District 9, where the VA in Phoenix is actually located within that district. Uh, Colonel Rogers, we were talking about solutions before the break. Should you win this seat, how will you put this topic front and center in Congress? Are you looking at prosecution, special investigations? How can you make change on this topic? This will be concluded by the time I take office in January, but let me just say that what it is indicative of is an overall casual disregard for life in this country, and a casual uh, disregard for service to country. And I hold the commander-in-chief, the president, squarely responsible at the top, and then it filters down. And Congress, right now, is comprised of only 19% veterans. 19% of Congress is veterans. In 1960, 80% of Congress was comprised of military veterans. So I think there is a correlation between how underrepresented the military is and veterans are in Congress with how the uh, treatment is. And the answer is to elect more real veterans to Congress. Well, that that would be you for one. Yes. Absolutely. I I am uh, a privileged uh, American who was able to serve her country uh, 20 years active duty, uh, first, as I said, as a clinical uh, social worker and then as a pilot uh, in the Air Force and uh, am a fifth generation in my family uh, to serve. There are Democrats and Republicans alike who are veterans who want to serve uh, and who should Serve. And we have veterans coming home now from Afghanistan and Iraq who are in Congress, and we need more veterans who have served uh, across the time continuum. I served in the Cold War and uh, uh, Desert Storm One. We need veterans of all uh, stripes and and walks of life and ages age uh, ranges to serve because that is how. You get to the heart of serving veterans. Well, not only that, it's better representation, for crying out loud, especially when topics like this come up. Uh, I've, I've heard some talk in, in recent weeks about something called the Management Accountability Act of 2014 uh, as one other solution to shaping up what's been happening at Veterans Affairs for so long amid all this scandal. I don't know much about it. Do you? Management Accountability Act of 2014 to get that passed through Congress now, I hear. Anything anything we can do to make a government agency more accountable, I am for. But here's the rub. Government is never good at business or management or leadership or accountability. It is just uh, not as good as uh, the capitalistic 
business market-based system uh, that our democracy thrives on. But the VA system is here. Uh, it is the system that we are saddled with. And so the best way uh, to make it accountable is to have people in Congress who understand it better, who understand what veterans go through more, and uh, who can hold it accountable. Uh, that is that's where I'm coming from. Who do you like in Congress right now in this interim period that's taking the bull by the horns and, and shaking it up? I mean, even to the point of criminal prosecution. Well, Jeff Miller of Florida, I am a big fan of, Congressman. In fact, uh, I talked to his uh, chief of staff just a few weeks ago when I was uh, in Washington, D.C., when Congressman Trent Franks endorsed me. Uh, and I talked to him. He uh, his boss is likely to take over. Uh, Jeff Miller is likely to take on the uh, chairmanship of the House Intelligence Committee, which Chairman Mike Rogers from Michigan uh, is retiring from. So, you know, these I, I talked to Mike Rogers, actually, no relation to me, uh, same spelling, R-O-G-E-R-S, uh, from Michigan. And he looked me in the eye and he said, Wendy, I need you on the House Intelligence Committee because you understand what a top secret clearance is. And what he was saying to me was that very few congressmen or congresswomen understood that. I intuitively understand it because I had a top secret clearance and served for 20 years. And so uh, that is my hope is to serve on the House Intelligence Committee as one uh, place to, to serve, for example. But, Wendy, do you think the American public is much more sensitive, just the average person on the street, to veterans' needs and serving our country uh, than they ever used to be? I do. I remember Vietnam, how we took our vets and kind of kicked them to the curb and, and paid no attention to them. And I think that has changed for the better. However, the sad thing and ironic thing is that that's not coming from the top. It's not with the administration. It's not with the bureaucracy and sadly not with some brass actually that are in positions of authority, certainly not with this administration, but with the good people of America. I go through airport or airports all the time and somebody will be in a uniform and they'll get applause they'll get a thank you for your service sir especially because of the multiple deployments but but sadly i don't think it's coming from the top i think you're right in one respect there is more uh positive feeling toward the military than there was uh, when i went to college and was one of only 18 commissioned from a huge state university in 1976 uh there is more positive emotion and uplifting feeling towards a military member, but there's also a lack of knowledge. There's also a lot of pity out there, which is a whole other topic to discuss, but it's one of my uh, pet peeves that we not uh, uh, go over into the uh, pity uh, part of the spectrum when it comes to veterans, but instead have respect, and I and I do I do applaud Americans for having uh, respect for veterans more nowadays, certainly more mm-hmm. so than mm-hmm. uh, 30 years ago. But we have to be careful, and and it's only because there are so few now, percentage wise of our of our greater population who serve. Uh, it doesn't, as I showed in the statistic about Congress, it doesn't transcend across our society in terms of there's no draft anymore, mm-hmm. uh, there's no what? compulsory component uh, to service. So what you have typically now, and, and if you read up on this, you'll, you'll see this, uh, you have sons and daughters of military serving and then their sons and daughters serving. Colonel Roger, be- I, I understand. I think we got the point across. We need to leave it there. Uh, I want to thank you for your service and wish you good luck on the campaign trail. Come back and visit with us on this subject on KFYI. Thank you, Wendy. Thank you, Terry. Thank you. All right. Uh, hour number two, straight ahead on the Terry Gilbert Show. We're going to talk about business in the Valley and where we're at.